So the 12th and the final theme of uh, environmental and natural resource economics course concerns uh, accounting for the environment uh, and particularly in the context of the like system uh, at the macro level of a uh, system of uh, national accounts. So in this first part of the of the video lessons, I will start with them discussing some limitations of the uh, cross domestic product or GDP as a measure of uh, of well-being. So firstly, I want to highlight that uh, that uh, GDP is actually uh, one of the major innovations in in uh, uh, economics in the in the twentieth century. So I start by going back to the uh, period known as the Great Depression, starting from the um, financial financial market uh, collapse in the New York in, in 1929, and leading up to the to the beginning of the Second World War in, in 1939. So this picture is is illustrating the development of um, um, there is per capita income uh, indicated over the years, and then there's a table. With some kind of changes in the economic indicators in four countries the united states the united kingdom france and germany and uh, you can see that the industrial production wholesale prices and foreign trade fell dramatically and there was a huge surge in unemployment in all four countries but uh, the policymakers at that time they didn't really have a very very uh, clear idea of what is what is happening in the economy so so there would be this kind of uh, uh, kind of rougher measures but at that time there was not such thing as the gdp cross domestic product to give a like overall view of what is uh, what is the um, aggregate demand and aggregate uh, supply in the in the economy so perhaps that also this kind of uh, deficiencies in the measurement uh, led to also uh, somewhat um, somewhat uh, ineffective policy decisions in many many of the countries and made the depression even even deeper than it, it uh, could have been otherwise. So already uh, during this uh, great depression there was some initiatives to to improve the matters and improve the measurements. So in this course we have encountered the name of Simon Kuznets earlier in the context of uh, the environmental Kuznets curve, although although Kuznets was not really yeah, proposing that concept uh, directly. However, he was really one of the main architects of the, of the modern system of uh, national accounts. And um, after the Second World War, then it was, was adopted uh, worldwide and there was uh, um, United Nations uh, uh, system of national accounts in 1953 kind of kind of uh, laid down the foundations that uh, that in practice uh, all the nations around the world are using nowadays. And uh, over the years, there have been also several uh, adjustments or revisions to this kind of uh, accounting practices, so that, uh, for example, how the value added of the public sector is is being accounted. Uh, so um, the the practice or it's kind of kind of a political choice in some sense is that is that the, the public sector value added is uh, um, calculated based on the on the public expenditures. So there is not any kind of profit mar margin included in the public sector services, which are not really sold in the in the marketplace. This can be can be justified, but also also in some sense then the treatment is somewhat different from the from the uh, private sector. So, so countries which have a large public sector um, are then somewhat, uh, somewhat uh, different compared to countries where the public sector is very small. Uh, in the initial uh, system of national accounts, the financial industries were not, um, they, they were kind of left out because it was thought that, uh, that financial services, they don't really produce anything. They have only this kind of intermediating function but uh, but later the value added of financial industries has been included in the in the system of national accounts and therefore also in gdp and nowadays in in uh, uh, countries such as the switzerland or the uk 
the financial industries actually have a very large proportion of the of the GDP. Then also there is adjustment um, uh, for the for the so-called homeowners imputed rent. So the idea is usually that uh, that in the national accounts the uh, everything is based on observed transactions, but uh, but um, home ownership is is one important exception. Because uh, uh, in countries where where most uh, households are are renting their homes, then of course the the rent is is uh, is a financial transaction, and this rent is of course. Uh, uh, creates revenue to the landlord, so so obviously the the rental uh, val value added of the of the rental income is is contributing to the to the GDP. But if you own your home, then obviously you do not pay rent for yourself. So because in some countries uh, a large proportion of households are owning their homes, there to make it more comparable, then uh, this kind of um, uh, Kind of a, not not actual, but kind of imputed rent refers to that it's it's not actually paid, but but it's kind of calculated anyway as a part of GDP that how much these homeowners would pay rent if if they were uh, if they were having to pay rent for themselves. So so this is some kind of adjustment uh, beyond this kind of observed transactions. So. Therefore, in the in the um, book by Coyle, uh, Coyle says that uh, that the actual number for GDP is uh, therefore the product of a vast patchwork of statistics and a complicated set of processes carried out on the raw data to fit them to the conceptual framework. So the main point here is to to emphasize that of course there are uh, certain conventions adopted in this in this measurement like this this. Uh, uh, concerning the value added of the public sector, financial industries, and and homeowners imputed rent, the measurement of intangible assets is also also a major headache. But I don't go to go to that so much in detail in this uh, this uh, this lesson. So of course this uh, uh, GDP is not like some kind of uh, word of God, but it's kind of uh, kind of. Um, it, it's, uh, there are certain agreed upon practices, and of course, some of these practices could be also also criticized. And um, Simon Kuznets later later also has uh, also, in my view, uh, presented a valid point that uh, that uh, uh, that the distinctions uh, must be kept in mind between quantity and quality of growth, between costs and returns, and between the short and long run. And goals for more growth should specify more growth of what and and for what. So in in that sense, the just economic growth itself is is not necessarily a meaningful target. It's also the quality of growth that uh, that matters. And in that sense, of course, it's important to understand that the, that the GDP is uh, is uh, uh, by by no means any any perfect measure. So here is some some uh, additional also discussion that I took from Wikipedia. So some of these kind of uh, recognized factors that influence the standard of living but are not captured well in the in the GDP uh, include and interestingly the first first item is externalities, and this is of course something that we have discussed uh, uh, a lot in this this course, so this is of course very very central theme in environmental economics. So I do not go to go to that anymore in this uh, this presentation. Uh, of course, there's also non-market transactions. So for example, household uh, household production. So for example, if you cook yourself a meal, then this doesn't contribute to the GDP, but it would would um, contribute to your your standard of living. However, if you go out to to a, to a restaurant or or you you order order some food home, then then of course this this kind of meal would contribute to the GDP. And uh, same applies, of course, like uh, like home cleaning and other kind of services. So so in countries where it is very common to 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 use this kind of uh, services, then uh, then uh, the GDP level tends to be higher compared to countries where 
households are producing a lot of uh, goods themselves, cooking and cleaning, for example, themselves. Then one important issue that I come back to in the in the later lesson still is the quality improvements and the inclusion of new products. So, so with the um, rapid uh, technological development, especially in the uh, computers and uh, information technology like mobile phones and all, all these kind of software products. So this is also, also, it's not only that there are new products that didn't exist before, we have also a lot of uh, free products and, and also like, for example, the, the price of computers tended to decrease over time, but, but there's still this kind of functionality and computational power was increasing despite the price, uh, price decrease. So taking these kind of uh, uh, very fast uh, technological improvements in, in uh, some respects uh, and some of the products is also a, a major difficulty to, to capture in the, in the measure GDP. And finally, of course, then, then it's, it's important to understand that GDP is, um, is a flow measure uh, but for maybe for the standard of living, the, the stock of wealth is, is uh, even more important. Uh, and, and then there's also the distribution of, uh, of uh, both income and, and also wealth. And, uh, and this kind of in economic inequalities are not also uh, captured well by, by measures such as GDP. So therefore, there have been some some initiatives to try to have a more broader um, broader measures of welfare. So this forms the next theme of my my next video lesson when I go to this kind of attempts to to uh, go beyond the the official GDP and and uh, and uh, develop so called composite welfare indicators. See you next time. Bye bye.